Art in the Islamic world has always been reduced to a few elements of expression. One expression is with the creativity of architectural and geometric design, while the second has been calligraphy. Only on the geographic peripheries of the Islamic empire in its heyday do we witness the creation of vast amounts of art that invoke figural works that stray away from the limited modes of expression available to Muslims. We see artistic easing of natural representations with the Mongol and Mughal kingdoms, as well as with many examples of art in Andalusia, Spain. Beyond these two civilizations, it is only during the Ottoman Empire when we see further iterations of art that deviate from the isolated Muslim practice of geometry and calligraphy, slowly garnering more momentum towards the use of non-Islamic figurative art in their expressions. Up until the 18th century, it was only the Ottomans who represented Islam and the Middle Eastern region within their visual arts. Then came Napoleon with his conquest of Egypt, and everything changed. Never to look back with the invasion of Orientalism. Orientalism is the intentional strategy of patronizing Western depictions of the East, and especially Arab culture, that were bound up with imperialism, creating stereotypes of the other. The other in this case being the Orientals, those that were an uncivilized and uneducated peoples living in what is now the Middle East. Others in the sense that these people were not of the same enlightened standard of Europe. They were an opposite, a distant and almost different creed of human. These thoughts and findings are echoed in the writings of Edward Said, a Palestinian American professor, author, and political activist, who in 1978 published his now famous book, Orientalism. Said wouldn't stop there. He concluded that Orientalism was a systematic discipline by which European culture was able to manage and even produce the Orient politically, sociologically, militarily, ideologically, scientifically, and imaginatively during the post-Enlightenment period. It sounds like a fantastic and quite a Hollywoodish invention. In reality, it actually was. And it's this invention I want to discuss. How and why did the Europeans create such powerful propaganda about the Arab world? Literature in both fiction and non-fiction form was indeed the main culprit of this strategy. But also as important and at times more impactful was the expressive art that reflected the lives and traditions of the Arab world back in the late 18th to the early 20th century, capturing the stereotypical impressions both in image and in detail. With literature, one needed to read, though, to be able to have an impression of Arabs or Muslims. But with art, everyone was a critic. As for the question of why Europeans would propagate such propaganda, it was simple. Colonialism and imperialism. It was necessary to justify the expansionist actions both to the political elite of the Occident, namely France and Britain, while also providing the critical subtext to their populations that what was being done in terms of imminent imperialist actions was indeed in the best interest for all. We could dive into the great number of written Orientalist texts like Gustave Flaubert's Salambo, Gérard de Nerval's Voyage in the Orient, or Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. But our principal interest in this story is more focused on the expressive art element, and I will use three individual artworks to reflect and speak of the three main angles that Orientalist propaganda utilized in diminishing the value of Arab and Muslim humanity through art. Some of the first 19th century Orientalist paintings were intended as propaganda in support of French imperialism, depicting the East as a place of inferiority, of a backwardness, lawlessness, or barbarism that would be enlightened and tamed by Western rule. We see many iterations of wars, infighting, and massacres as topics expressed upon in the works of many French and British artists. One clear example of this concept is the painting Napoleon in the Plague House at Jaffa by Antoine Jean Gros. We see the French general almost positioned as a prophet, a healer, bathing in the rays of enlightenment and with his divine touch of a king, healing a sick man who, in this visualization, with a full beard, might be presumed as an Arab. It is an architecturally Arab scene where the superiority of the Occident is signified by the French flag that flutters high 
above the city in Palestine. What is also intentionally being relayed is that the East is sick. It is both uncivilized and diseased. And although there are Arabs present in the image, assisting with the sick, yet they appear healthy and unaffected, but are only so because they are accustomed to the uncleanliness, unaffected by their own dysfunctional environment. Another key theme that was thoroughly circulated amongst Orientalist art was the element of heathenism, when Christianity was positioned as a far superior faith. Consequently, Mohammedism, as Islam was known to the West at the time, had to be discredited in all shapes and form. And one such cheap trick was in the superimposing of unacceptable moral behavior within religious contexts like mosques, or in the reflections on a faith that was still raw and disorganized in its expression. Evening Prayer in the Sahara by Gustave Guillaume exactly reflects this last point of a faith that is rife with chaos and disorder. A faith that appears to be ancient, and in that sense, primitive. August Cordier, a well-known French publisher, in reviewing the painting when it was exhibited at the Paris Salon of 1863, commented on the sharpness and depth of its colors, as well as on the authenticity and sobriety of the whole scene, most particularly in the figures of the praying Arabs. Now when we look at this painting with an Arab and Muslim lens, we immediately recognize the inaccuracy of the whole scene, starting with the exaggerated gesticulations of the believer at the forefront of the scene. In parallel, those praying are facing all sorts of ways, maybe seven to eight different directions. Prayer in Islam is towards a single direction only, and that's Makkah. Such a fundamental miss is a significant tell on the lack of authenticity of the observations by the artist, or else all this scene is purely a figment of his imagination. The third, final, and most significant element presented in Orientalist art deals with the immorality premise of the Arab and Muslim world. Here, there are numerous topics that position the indigenous people in a dark light, including polygamy, slavery, sexual violence, concubinage, homoeroticism, and even pedophilia. These accusations are meant to establish a level of fear and disgust of the Arab and Muslim world. And such a shocking story only serves the distancing of the Arabs from mankind, and towards a lesser and lesser humane existence. We see this with the same image that Edward Said used for the cover of the first print of his book, with the Serpent Charmer by Jean-Léon Jérôme. We bear witness to a shocking image of a fantastical scene that is unacceptable in any substantiation. A nude prepubescent boy is standing alone, naked. And opposite him are a group of sitting men who are admiring something. We're unsure as to whether it's the snake that's garnering their attention or the undressed boy himself. The added element of fantasy that involves the scene is its location. It appears to be in a mosque, as indicated by all the Quranic inscriptions that adorn the turquoise blue wall. And that superimposition of the profane with the sacred within one image, no matter how precise the painting technique was, adds to the preposterousness of the scene and its purported accurate depiction of life within the Islamic world. There are many more Orientalist artistic works that attempt to characterize Arabs negatively, such as with depictions of laziness, cruelty, and decadence. Artistic expressions where one can only conclude that all these works must be dismissed, discarded, forgotten, and ignored, so that no one is given an irresponsibly incorrect and negative impression of Arabs and Muslims, even if such depictions when consumed by viewers today are globally acknowledged as antiquated behavior of the past. Yet still, these artworks, though, remain inaccurate and misrepresentative of the reality of the Arab world at the time. And it's with this dismissal sentiment that the conundrum appears to me. If we dismiss all this erroneous historical uh, visual record, are we also abandoning the smaller percentage of factual representations that do inform us about our Arab identity from the late 18th century to the beginnings of the 20th century? 
I personally struggle with this question all the time in the generation of my content. It's the only physical, visual record and evidence we have, even if it's embedded with negativity and misrepresentation. I guess it comes down to being aware and intelligent in separating and taking the harmful from the useful, and identifying what is absurd, inconsequential, and what feels right and comfortable for us as Arabs to take in from the vast catalog of oriental imagery out there. A picture is indeed worth a thousand words, true. And for this era in our history, couldn't we benefit from two to three hundred of those words per image to have a stronger sense of our past and possibly our identity?